All right. Somebody who asked me this morning, am I still teaching Revelation this morning? Like we've been at this for three years already. I said, we've been at this for like four weeks, but I'll guarantee you we haven't gotten into the text yet. And, uh, and we won't today either. Because the book well introduced is a book what? Well taught, half taught. And uh, really it is with the book of Revelation. We still have some more things to get to. Uh, by way of review, I want to suggest to you that we can understand this book. We can understand the book of Revelation. Somebody else asked me if I was teaching Revelation this morning. And uh, there were two people there back in the back. And they said, well, what are you going to reveal? <laughs> I said, hopefully nothing that isn't found in the book of revealing, in the apocalypse, in the revelation. I said, I'm not teaching special revelation. Um, there is no special revelation, continuing revelation today. The faith has been once and for all delivered to us, and I'm glad that it has. I hope you are, but we can understand the book of revelation. If you are sitting in this class, not thinking you can understand Revelation. You're wasting your time. You need to find another class. Really. Because we need students in here that believe. Do you believe that Revelation is part of the canon? Part of the truth? Yes. So Revelation is truth. Right? Jesus said, you shall know the truth. We're putting this in a syllogism. Therefore you can know Revelation. If it's truth, and you shall know the truth, you don't suppose Jesus would give us a book that we couldn't understand? You know, a lot of people in the church believe that about Revelation. And uh, that's just not true. And I hope that we can show that throughout the next few months. It's important to understand and to have this foundation that we've been laying for the last few weeks. I hope you've been taking notes. I hope you've been uh, getting ready, if you haven't yet, to get copies, uh, electronic copies of the class. Whatever is necessary in order to keep these introductory thoughts in our minds. Some hermeneutical thoughts. So important. What does the word hermeneutics mean? Simply, that's a big word with such an easy meaning. What is it? What is hermeneutics? The method of applying and interpreting scripture. That's it. Hermeneutics is not a biblical word. It's not necessarily a spiritual word. Hermeneutics just means the science. What is a science? In contrast to an art? Factual. Objective. When we think of truth, we think of objective truth. When we think of an art, the way that something is presented, when we think of drawings and paintings, it's up to subjective ideas in the minds of the author. The Bible is not an art. Now, the way we present the Bible is an art. And we all have our different ways of doing that. But the Bible itself is a science. It is factual. It is truth. It is objective. Unlike subjective art. Now, there's never been a preacher that would present a lesson in exactly the same way. And God knows that. Because it's an art. There's not objectivity to presenting a lesson. <clears throat> but in the lesson itself, in the words, I just love it when someone accuses me of preaching the same thing that other preachers in the Church of Christ preach. <laughs> they don't know what a compliment that is. <laughs> because it's objective truth. It should be the same. Right? If Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then so should what came out of his mouth. And that's true. And we all would that the whole religious world would be preaching that same message. 
But the way that it's done is different. Well, in the book of Revelation, there is objective truth. And we're supposed to learn that objective truth. And the Lord promises that we can do that. Always interpret the word of God according to the purpose of the author. True or false? True. That is, an, that is axiomatic. That is a given. That is true. And, and we do that, don't we? But we need to especially do that in the book of Revelation. So I've got a question to ask. From a hermeneutical standpoint, but also from a practical standpoint. What in the world would the message of Revelation have to do with our first century, second century brethren to whom the letter was initially written? If the book of Revelation was intended to predict events that have not yet happened. When John begins this great book by saying that these things must shortly come to pass. Do you know that the futuristic method approach to the book of Revelation says that everything between chapters, well, basically everything after chapter 4 is yet future. If that's true, and it was so important to keep this message from Rome, and it was giving them hope of how to hang on through all of this persecution, the great beast, don't worry about that. That's, that's, that's not in the first century. Who could believe it? So many things that we'll be talking, but we've got to remember that hermeneutical rule. It's so important. The message, the intent of the author of the message in the context in which it's first given is so important. Those of you that have glasses or contacts, contacts, If they're 21st century mechanisms, you need to take them off in this class. And you need to put on first century glasses. And then when we make application, we'll put back on our 21st century glasses. That's how you approach the book of Revelation. It must be studied that way. And really, so should any book. That is just raw understanding of biblical interpretation, hermeneutics. When we use the word hermeneutics in the biblical sense, we're talking about the science of biblical, the science, the absoluteness of biblical interpretation. The work of the exegete. Now, I didn't say a parakeet. I said an exegete. Are you an exegete or are you an eisegete? Which one are you? X? X. What does X mean? I think Lincoln teaches the young kids when he talks about X of this. What the theme of the book of Exodus is. What is the theme of the book of Exodus? Yeah, leaving. Going out. Children of Israel leaving Egypt. So an X a G, you know, the definition of word is usually in the word itself. Even in the even in the English word, many times it's there. Ek means out. Gnosko, to know. If you are a student of the Bible, you should be an exegete. You are trying to extract what the intent of the Holy Spirit is. And what the intent of the author was initially to whom it was written and the application to us today. That's what a true exegete is. But if you are an eisegete, what do you do? What does ice mean? 
Yeah, you are taking whatever preconceived ideas and you are reading that into the text. Oh, not good. Not good at all. Just because somebody in their mind may have a neat little package of understanding of how 666 could be related to somebody's first and last name with, or, and middle name with six letters in it, 666. And, oh, that's, that's cute. That doesn't mean it's right. Because that can be more eisegesis putting into the text than exegesis extracting from it. We don't want to be eisegetes in the book of Revelation. Too, 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 too many of those already. Holy Spirit, John, what did you intend for the original recipients? And then, having that firmly in our minds, what is the application today? But you know, that takes a little more thought, you know? I guess it takes muscle and a what? You know, we can't take the book of Revelation to pill and say, uh-huh, I've been to a couple of classes, and I kind of was haphazard about that, and now I understand Revelation. Nope. Nope. Study to show yourself. That doesn't say take a pill and show yourself approved to God. And you're gonna and the and the word is gonna somehow be miraculously infused in your mind. Remember, spiritual gifts don't happen today. We can't get it that way. We've got to study. And, and the word there for study actually is give diligence. Give diligence, of course, by study to show yourself approved unto God. Workmen that need not be ashamed. Now notice the example of that principle. Rightly dividing the word of truth. So I've got to divide the book of Revelation as a whole, even to when it was penned. Because if I'm an early date believer to the book of Revelation, I have a totally different approach to that book. If I'm a late date approach, if I have a late date approach to the book of Revelation, I have another idea of that book. That's why this introduction is so important. I hope, I hope you're saying that. Carefully considering the immediate context, which will greatly assist us in exegeting any doubtful passage. Pilate asked a question of our Lord when our Lord was on trial. You remember that, that infamous question that he asked? What is truth? Now, how do we know or not whether Pilate was sincere in that question? You have to be hermeneutical exegetes to be able to come to that conclusion. How so? First of all, if you notice the text, Pilate did not give Jesus time to answer that question. What is truth? The context, uh, the context shows us that Pilate is no inquirer of truth. That's not what his point in asking that question was. Even more literally, that question in English should be, what do you know about truth? And he asks it in derision. What do you know about truth? Sarcastic. Very sarcastic. Which is a figure of speech, isn't it? Sarcasm. Most of us are pretty good at using that figure of speech. Happy Father's Day. I know sometimes I can be sarcastic. And I know sometimes you can be too. Pilate was being sarcastic in that question. What he's saying is, the wisest philosophers are not agreed as to a standard by which truth can be attained. So you've presented a subject here, Jesus of Nazareth, about which you know nothing. And how do you know that? Well, because that's what the context indicates. Pilate thought Jesus to be a harmless crank. A man of no glaring faults and not worthy of death. This was a Jewish matter. 
Oh, when he washed his hands, he wished he could wash them in Jewish water and get it over back to them. I don't see anything that this man's done. He's just, you know, a, a, a rebel Jew. I have better ways to spend my time. There's nothing worthy of death about what's happened here. He claims to be the king of the Jews. Do I care? That's, that's the idea. Pilate wasn't inquiring about what he thought. With this insignificant Galilean thought about truth. It's important then, as we lay this foundation, as we've talked now for weeks about figurative language and, and literal language, as we've talked about, you never interpret a, a, an unclear passage of Scripture. That's never your foundation. You don't, you, you don't interpret clear passages in light of unclear passages. You do it the other way around. You don't go to the book of Revelation more times than not to prove something that is clear. You don't take the book of Revelation and formulate doctrine around it. That's why when I meet somebody for the first time and going to study the Bible, when I know the first place they want to go is the book of Revelation, I know I've got my work cut out for me. In convincing that person to hold off just a little bit, promising them we'll get there, but let's lay some foundational truths that are so clear that when we get to the book of Revelation, we will be able to interpret that highly, highly figurative book in light of clear, literal passages of Scripture. And our interpretation, then if our interpretation of Revelation contradicts what we know to be true, guess what about our interpretation of Revelation? It is not right. We don't question the clear passage. Especially in chapters 4 through 19. There are more, many more clear passages of Scripture in the first three church, uh, three churches. I'm getting ahead of myself. The first three chapters about the seven churches. And in the last couple of chapters dealing with the return of Christ. But the life that we live in between is not to be the foundation. You know, when someone says Revelation 20 is the sugar stick or is the foundation of this particular doctrine, I hope in your mind many red flags go up. I want to look now as we continue this introduction. And setting the stage for a well-taught book, I want to look at a couple, well, I'm not literal there, a few, a few passages, clear passages, must understood passages that will help us in context when we get into the text of Revelation. Some are Old Testament, some are New Testament, and most of these deal with the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Okay? The kingdom. It is so important to understand this because the bulk of misunderstanding in the book of Revelation comes from a faulty understanding of what the Bible clearly teaches about the kingdom. The beast. What kingdom is he in? The kingdom. Is it even here or not? The kingdom. Is it the church? Is the kingdom and the church separate? Separate? Are they separate entities? The kingdom. What do we know about the kingdom? Much said in the Bible about the kingdom. When is it established? Has it been established? 
You see, the basis of the misunderstanding of the book of Revelation is not understanding the kingdom. If one understands the kingdom, and I'm glad we're doing it this way, this should influence the approach even that you take to the book itself. Because, and we're going to study the methods. I don't know if we'll get into that this week or not. The methods of interpretation of the book of Revelation. The number one method we're going to study is the futuristic method. And this method is usually the one taken by those that subscribe to a doctrine called premillennialism. They believe that the events of four through the end of the chapter are yet future. And in denominational circles, especially modern denominational circles, now that's interesting. One of the, uh, the uh, commentaries of the book of Revelation that I recommended to you was written by a, a Baptist, a denominationalist, but he's not a futurist. The futurist position was started by a man by the name of John Darby back in the uh, first decade of the, of the last century, around 1915. And he made, which is basically, religiously speaking, a Johnny-come-lately uh, doctrine. And what he presented from the context of the book of Rest uh, Revelation is dispensationalism. Which basically combines the continual historical approach and the futuristic approach and has come up with, from the beginning of time, there are seven different dispensations. But we are between the sixth and seventh dispensation, and this also relates to the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel, misunderstanding of that in Daniel chapter 9. You're familiar with the 70 weeks. Well, after the 69th week, there has been this great pause since the uh, initiation of the church. It, the clock has stopped. And then with the second advent, return of Christ, where the church is going to be raptured up, there's going to be... Uh, you know, the thousand-year reign of Christ, the battle of Armageddon, then that begins the 70th week of Daniel. See, there has to be this great divide there in order for this falsity to be injected into, into the Bible. And we're going to see that. All right, we're going to become familiar with these terms, so just going from the general to the specific right now. All right, turn your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 22. We're setting the foundation of biblical truth, clear passages of scripture that tell us about the kingdom, so we'll know what in the world John is prophesying from Patmos. Jeremiah 22, somebody read verse 30 for us real loud, please. Jeremiah 22, 30. Thus says the Lord. Write this man down as childless, a man who shall not prosper in his days, for none of his descendants shall prosper, sitting on the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. Oh boy. Jeremiah 22. What's the book of Jeremiah about? What's the theme of Jeremiah? You know. What's happening? Destruction of Jerusalem. Okay, the destruction of Jerusalem. And uh, who was destroying Jerusalem at this time? Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, good. In what, uh, in what nation? Babylon. Babylon. Babylon, right? Babylon. Remember, Daniel in chapter 2 would interpret the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. Remember that image? What was the head of gold? Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar, you, are, you O king, are the head of gold. Okay, well, here, the children of Israel were going into captivity. Basically, God says, okay, you're going in. You're going to be in for 70 years, so behave yourself while you're there. Be faithful, and I'll get you out. In fact, that's where synagogue worship started. Did you know that? 
You hear of Jewish synagogues today. They started in Babylon because they couldn't get to the temple in Jerusalem. They still have synagogues. If they were faithful Jews, where would they be going? They'd be going to Jerusalem. And those that think that the old law as a law for us today is still in effect, if they wanted to truly keep that law, guess where they would go to? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. But, beside the point. The point is this. Who is Jeremiah talking about as he begins verse 30? When he says, thus saith the Lord, write this man down childless. Who's the childless man? Yeah. Jeconiah. Here it says Coniah. Jeconiah. Matthew would say Jeconiah. And, uh, you know, in that first chapter that we like to skip over and we wonder why in the world are all these, and they're not genealogies. They are genealogies. And why is that genealogy there? Well, guess when we read through that genealogy, guess whose name is conspicuously there? This guy, Jeconiah. Which means he's in the lineage of who? Matthew chapter 1 and Jesus. He's in the lineage of Jesus. But Jeremiah is prophesying, write down this man childless. And he's talking about those, the offspring of Jeconiah, that would not sit on David's throne in Jerusalem. Is that what that verse says? Yeah. A man who shall not prosper in his days, for none of his descendants shall prosper. None of his descendants will sit on the throne of David and rule anymore in Judah. Guess who that includes? Jesus isn't going to reign from David's throne in Jerusalem? Listen, if you take the futuristic method approach to the book of Revelation... And you believe that Jesus is coming back to set up his kingdom. Guess where he's supposed to rule from? And not only just Jerusalem, but more specifically where? On the throne of David. On the throne of David. Jeremiah said, no descendant of Jeconiah will ever be on the throne of David anymore. In Jerusalem. In Judah. Figurative or literal. Clear or unclear. Now, what do the rest of the kingdom passages in the Bible teach? It's not like this is the only one. It's almost like God saw that false teaching coming and just fell. <laughs> There's a revelation for you. Yes, exactly right. Exactly right. Why would this be important? Why would he tell us that basically that you can read Jeremiah 22, compare it in the genealogy of Matthew 1 in the lineage of Jesus, and Jesus was a descendant of Jeconiah. Why would he do that? If not for the reason that Jimmy suggests. Why Jeconiah? Why did he pull out Jeconiah? Because he was ruling on David's throne. He knew that this false idea would be Perpetrate. No doubt. In our Nothing country. he teaches is physical. Pardon me? Nothing he is teaching is physical. Nothing he The is. throne, uh, the kingdom, none of this. Everything that's taught in the scripture is about what is spiritual, not physical. It's, a, it's primarily it's a spiritual, spiritual kingdom. kingdom. But with physical, literal traits that we can identify. So, but yes, it's primarily spiritual kingdom. The kingdom of God is within us, within our minds. It's a spiritual thing. But it's certainly objective. Look back at, uh, and that wasn't the first reference to this. Look back at Joshua chapter 21. Somebody read verses 43 through 45 for us. Joshua 21, 43 through 45. Remember the promises that were made to Abraham? What were those promises? 
Some, some view it as three promises. Some view it as one promise with three facets. I don't know how you think about the promise or promises made to Abraham, but what were they? Do you remember what they were? A land promise. From the river Euphrates to the sea toward the going down of the sun. Which sea was that? Mediterranean. Good. The Mediterranean Sea. East to west boundaries. North south boundaries from Dan to where? From Dan to Beersheba. All right. The land promise. What was the other promise or the other facet of the one promise? What about that sand by the seashore thing? Yes, God was going to multiply the descendants of Abraham like sand on the seashore. Wait a minute now. Sand on the seashore. Can you think of every grain of sand on the seashores? Literal or figurative? Oh, you're going to be great exegetes. <laughs> you're going to be great exegetes. You understand that, don't you? Don't let that fall the wayside when we get into the text of Revelation. Okay? Multiply your seed by sand on the seashore. Many. That's the idea, right? God's going to bless him with many descendants. All right? What was the third part of that one promise or the third promise? All nations would be blessed. That's why, and we'll talk a little bit about this in the um, lesson next hour, Abraham is the spiritual father, even of Christians today, because of his great faith. So, these were the promises made to Abraham. Now let's read verses 43 through 45 of Joshua chapter 21 and see what Joshua said about those promises made to Abraham. Somebody read it real loud for us. And the Lord gave unto Israel all the land. How much of the land? All Some. of the land. How much? All. All of the land. All right. That he swore to, gave, to give unto their fathers, and they possessed it and dwelt therein. They possessed it and dwelt in it. Some of it? All of it. Go. And the Lord gave them rest round about according to all that he sware unto their fathers. And there stood not a man of all their enemies before them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. There failed not aught of any good thing which the Lord had spoken unto the house of Israel. Let's say it together, the rest of it. All came to pass. Now, when somebody stand up and say that we don't know what that means, the futuristic method approach to the book of Revelation has to say, all did not come to pass. There's still the land promise that had to be fulfilled. And by the way, if you look at the nature of Solomon's kingdom, what did the Queen of Sheba say about Solomon's kingdom? Half has never been told. When she saw it, she about had a heart attack. She couldn't believe it. She saw this glorious kingdom. What happened after the first temple was destroyed and uh, the people returned at the degree of Cyrus who led the next nation after Babylon, the Medo-Persian, and allowed God's people to go back and return and built that second pe uh, that second temple. How did those people react when they looked at the second temple compared to the first one? What did they do? Did they jump for joy? Look at how much greater this is than Solomon's temple. They cried. They cried. And they should have cried because of their disobedience that led them into captivity to begin with. But God in his grace gave them a way out as he always does. That's what the Bible is. It's a book of God gives man blessings, man blows it, man sins, God sends somebody to, to try to restore it. That's, that's, the, that's the cycle through the Bible. 
according to this text, this clear text, everything that God promised to Abraham, the land they dwelled in, it all came to pass. And so anything or anyone who tells you today that we need to be friends of Israel, I think we need to be friends with Israel because they're a democracy, period. But if anybody tells you that we need to be friends with Israel because the Lord's going to establish his kingdom there, or that there's going to be this great battle, or fill in the blank ad infinitum, that is not right. All came to pass. God fulfilled his promise to Abraham. And he fulfilled his promise that in his seed all nations of the earth would be blessed through whom? That one was fulfilled too. All, all came to pass. And you'll be hearing me say that periodically through our study of the book of Revelation. And I really don't believe that there will be anybody that has diligently studied in this class conclude that the futuristic method to the book uh, approach to the book of Revelation is valid. If you are a true exegete, you can't do it. You can't do it. All right. Let's go to Mark chapter 9 and verse 1. We only have a couple more minutes. Mark chapter 9 and verse 1. And somebody read that verse for us. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1 teaches us that John came on the scene and he was teaching the people to repent for the kingdom of hand. You know, you, you know what phrase is just totally ignored by those that take this approach to the book of Revelation? It's the phrase at hand. Or soon shall come to pass. Like John says in, in verse 3 of Revelation 1, these things must shortly come to pass. John and Jesus, the apostles, were teaching, repent, the kingdom is shortly coming to pass. It's, it's coming. Okay? Premills cannot accept any of this. Because they believe that Jesus failed to establish the kingdom because the Jews wouldn't accept it. And so in this parenthetical part of the 70 weeks of Daniel, we've got to stop the clock because the Lord failed. And so when he comes the next time, he's going to get it right that time and establish the kingdom. Don't tell me that it doesn't matter with someone how someone views the kingdom or the church. And it doesn't matter what church you're. All right, Mark 9 1. Somebody read that. There be some of you standing here that shall not taste death until you see the kingdom come with power. Is that a clear passage of Scripture? Is there something difficult when Jesus said, Listen, fellows, some here will not die till they see the kingdom come with power? This verse has to be totally thrown out in order to believe that Christ is coming back to establish this earthly kingdom. In fact, that was... Jesus even brought... Jimmy talk about why did the Lord bring this up at his death. He said, my kingdom is not of what? This world. How does he... Now, the kingdom is in the world, right? I mean, the church is here. What did he mean by my kingdom is not of this world? There's a characteristic of this world that the church doesn't share that characteristic. And Jesus explains that characteristic. He said, if my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would what? The futuristic method of this book says that his servants might fight as Jesus is galloping on the white horse and we're fighting the battle of Armageddon. Now, are you going to take a figurative idea in the book of Revelation and make that the foundation of your belief? Or are you going to take what Joshua said, what Abraham said, what Jeremiah said, and now what Jesus said about the kingdom in no uncertain terms? Were there people there within the sound of Jesus that did not die till they saw the kingdom come? True or false? 
Then how can man just flippantly say that the kingdom is yet future? Because they're trusting themselves. That's right. Has the second bell rung yet? I'd like to read yeah. the second bell has rung. Figured it <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you for your attention. We'll pick up right there next week. Lord <laughs>